Chapter 18 In the Shadow of Sonoma Of myself, during this period, there is not much to say. For six months I was kept in prison, though charged with no crime. I was a suspect, a word of fear that all revolutionists were soon to come to know. But our own nascent secret service was beginning to work. By the end of my second month in prison, one of the jailers made himself known as a revolutionist in touch with the organization. Several weeks later, Joseph Parkhurst, the prison doctor who had just been appointed, proved himself to be a member of one of the fighting groups. Thus, throughout the organization of the oligarchy, our own organization, web-like and spidery, was insinuating itself. And so I was kept in touch with all that was happening in the world without, and furthermore, every one of our imprisoned leaders was in contact with brave comrades who masqueraded in the livery of the Iron Heel. Though Ernest lay in prison three thousand miles away on the Pacific coast, I was in unbroken communication with him, and our letters passed regularly back and forth. The leaders, in prison and out, were able to discuss and direct the campaign. It would have been possible within a few months to have effected the escape of some of them, but since imprisonment proved no bar to our activities, it was decided to avoid anything premature. Fifty-two congressmen were in prison, and fully three hundred more of our leaders. It was planned that they should be delivered simultaneously. If part of them escaped, the vigilance of the oligarchs might be aroused so as to prevent the escape of the remainder. On the other hand, it was held that a simultaneous jail delivery all over the land would have immense psychological influence on the proletariat. It would show our strength and give confidence. So it was arranged, when I was released at the end of six months, that I was to disappear and prepare a secure hiding place for Ernest. To disappear was in itself no easy thing. No sooner did I get my freedom than my footsteps began to be dogged by the spies of the Iron Heel. It was necessary that they should be thrown off the track, and that I should win to California. It is laughable the way this was accomplished. Already the passport system, modelled on the Russian, was developing. I dared not cross the continent in my own character. It was necessary that I should be completely lost if ever I was to see Ernest again, for by trailing me after he escaped, he would be caught once more. Again, I could not disguise myself as a proletarian and travel. There remained the disguise of a member of the oligarchy. While the arch-oligarchs were no more than a handful, there were myriads of lesser ones of the type, say, of Mr. Wixon, men worth a few millions who were adherents of the arch-oligarchs. The wives and daughters of these lesser oligarchs were legion, and it was decided that I should assume the disguise of such a one. A few years later this would have been impossible, because the passport system was to become so perfect that no man, woman, nor child in all the land was unregistered and unaccounted for in his or her movements. When the time was ripe, the spies were thrown off my track. An hour later Avis Everhard was no more. At that time, one Felice van Verdehen, accompanied by two maids and a lapdog, with another maid for the lapdog, entered a drawing-room on a pullman, and a few minutes later was speeding west. Note. This ridiculous picture well illustrates the heartless conduct of the masters. While people starved, lapdogs were waited upon by maids. This was a serious masquerade on the part of Avis Everhard. Life and death and the cause were in the issue. Therefore the picture must be accepted as a true picture. It affords a striking commentary of the times. Note. Pullman. The designation of the more luxurious railway cars of the period, and so named from the inventor. The three maids who accompanied me were revolutionists. Two were members of the fighting groups, and the third, Grace Holbrook, entered a group the following year, and six months later was executed by the Iron Heel. She it was who waited upon the dog. Of the other two, Bertha Stoll disappeared twelve years later, while Anne Royalston still lives and plays an increasingly important part in the revolution. Note. Despite continual and almost inconceivable hazards, Anna Royalston lived to the royal age of ninety-one, as the Pococks defied the executioners of the fighting groups, so she defied the executioners of the Iron Heel. She bore a charmed life and prospered amid dangers and alarms. She herself was an executioner for the fighting groups, and, known as the Red Virgin, she became one of the inspired figures of the Revolution. When she was an old woman of sixty-nine, she shot bloody Hawcliffe down in the midst of his armed escort and got away unscathed. In the end, she died peaceably of old age in a secret refuge of the Revolutionists in the Ozark Mountains. Without adventure, we crossed the United States to California. When the train stopped at 16th Street Station in Oakland, we alighted, and there, Felice Van Verden, with her two maids, her lapdog, and her lapdog's maid, disappeared forever. The maids, guided by trusty comrades, were led away. Other comrades took charge of me. Within half an hour after leaving the train, I was on board a small fishing boat and out on the waters of San Francisco Bay. The winds baffled, and we drifted aimlessly the greater part of the night. 
but I saw the lights of Alcatraz where Ernest lay, and found comfort in the thought of nearness to him. By dawn, what with the rowing of the fishermen, we made the Marin Islands. Here we lay in hiding all day, and on the following night, swept on by a flood tide and a fresh wind, we crossed San Pablo Bay in two hours, and ran up Petaluma Creek. Here horses were ready, and another comrade, and without delay we were away through the starlight. To the north I could see the loom of Sonoma Mountain, toward which we rode. We left the old town of Sonoma to the right, and rode up a canyon that lay between outlying buttresses of the mountain. The wagon road became a wood road, the wood road became a cowpath, and the cowpath dwindled away and ceased among the upland pastures. Straight over Sonoma Mountain we rode. It was the safest route. There was no one to mark our passing. Dawn caught us on the northern brow, and in the grey light we dropped down through the chaparral into redwood canyons, deep and warm with the breath of passing summer. It was old country to me that I knew and loved, and soon I became the guide. The hiding place was mine. I had selected it. We let down the bars and crossed an upland meadow. Next we went over a low, oak-covered ridge and descended into a smaller meadow. Again we climbed a ridge, this time riding under red-limbed madronas and manzanitas of deeper red. The first rays of the sun streamed upon our backs as we climbed. A flight of quail thrummed off through the thickets. A big jackrabbit crossed our path, leaping swiftly and silently like a deer. And then a deer, a many-pronged buck, the sun flashing red gold from neck and shoulders, cleared the crest of the ridge before us and was gone. We followed in his wake a space, then dropped down a zigzag trail that he disdained into a group of noble redwoods that stood about a pool of water murky with minerals from the mountainside. I knew every inch of the way. Once, a writer friend of mine had owned the ranch, but he, too, had become a revolutionist, though more disastrously than I, for he was already dead and gone, and none knew where nor how. He alone, in the days he had lived, knew the secret of the hiding place for which I was bound. He had bought the ranch for beauty, and paid a round price for it, much to the disgust of the local farmers. He used to tell with great glee how they were wont to shake their heads mournfully at the price, to accomplish ponderously a bit of mental arithmetic, and then to say, but you can't make six per cent on it. But he was dead now, nor did the ranch descend to his children. Of all men it was now the property of Mr. Wixon, who owned the whole eastern and northern slopes of Sonoma Mountain, running from the Spreckles estate to the divide of Bennett Valley. Out of it he had made a magnificent deer park, where, over thousands of acres of sweet slopes and glades and canyons, the deer ran almost in primitive wildness. The people who had owned the soil had been driven away. A state home for the feeble-minded had also been demolished to make room for the deer. To cap it all, Wixon's hunting lodge was a quarter of a mile from my hiding place. This, instead of being a danger, was an added security. We were sheltered under the very aegis of one of the minor oligarchs. Suspicion by the nature of the situation was turned aside. The last place in the world the spies of the Iron Heel would dream of looking for me, and for Ernest when he joined me, was Wixon's deer park. We tied our horses among the redwoods at the pool. From a cache behind a hollow rotting log my companion brought out a variety of things, a fifty-pound sack of flour, tinned foods of all sorts, cooking utensils, blankets, a canvas tarpaulin, books and writing material, a great bundle of letters, a five-gallon can of kerosene, an oil stove, and, last and most important, a large coil of stout rope. So large was the supply of things that a number of trips would be necessary to carry them to the refuge. But the refuge was very near. Taking the rope and leading the way, I passed through a glade of tangled vines and bushes that ran between two wooded knolls. The glade ended abruptly at the steep bank of a stream. It was a little stream, rising from springs, and the hottest summer never dried it up. On every hand were tall wooded knolls, a group of them, with all the seeming of having been flung there from some careless titan's hand. There was no bedrock in them. There rose from their bases hundreds of feet, and they were composed of red volcanic earth, the famous wine soil of Sonoma. Through these the tiny stream had cut its deep and precipitous channel. It was quite a scramble down to the stream bed, and, once on the bed, we went downstream perhaps for a hundred feet, and then we came to the great hole. There was no warning of the existence of the hole, nor was it a hole in the common sense of the word. One crawled through tight-locked briars and branches, and found oneself on the very edge, peering out and down through a green screen. A couple of hundred feet in length and width, it was half of that in depth. Possibly because of some fault that had occurred when the knolls were flung together, and certainly helped by freakish erosion, the hole had been scooped out in the course of centuries by the wash of water. Nowhere did the raw earth appear. All was garmented by vegetation, from tiny maidenhair and gold-back ferns to mighty redwood and douglas spruces. 
These great trees even sprang out from the walls of the hole. Some leaned over at angles as great as forty-five degrees, though the majority towered straight up from the soft and almost perpendicular earth walls. It was a perfect hiding place. No one ever came there, not even the village boys of Glen Ellen. Had this hole existed in the bed of a canyon a mile long, or several miles long, it would have been well known. But this was no canyon. From beginning to end, the length of the stream was no more than five hundred yards. Three hundred yards above the hole, the stream took its rise in a spring at the foot of a flat meadow. A hundred yards below the hole, the stream ran out into open country, joining the main stream and flowing across rolling and grass-covered land. My companion took a turn of the rope around a tree, and with me fast on the other end lowered away. In no time I was on the bottom, and in but a short while he had carried all the articles from the cache and lowered them down to me. He hauled the rope up and hid it, and before he went away called down to me a cheerful parting. Before I go on, I want to say a word for this comrade, John Carlson, a humble figure of the Revolution, one of the countless faithful ones in the ranks. He worked for Wixon, in the stables near the hunting lodge. In fact, it was on Wixon's horses that we had ridden over Sonoma Mountain. For nearly twenty years now, John Carlson has been custodian of the refuge. No thought of disloyalty, I am sure, has ever entered his mind during all that time. To betray his trust would have been in his mind a thing undreamed. He was phlegmatic, stolid, to such a degree that one could not but wonder how the revolution had any meaning to him at all. And yet love of freedom glowed somberly and steadily in his dim soul. In ways it was indeed good that he was not flighty and imaginative. He never lost his head. He could obey orders, and he was neither curious nor garrulous. Once I asked how it was that he was a revolutionist. When I was a young man, I was a soldier, was his answer. It was in Germany. There, all young men must be in the army. So I was in the army. There was another soldier there, a young man, too. His father was what you call an agitator, and his father was in jail for Lee's majesty, what you call speaking the truth about the emperor. And the young man, the son, talked with me much about people, and work, and the robbery of the people by the capitalists. He made me see things in new ways and I became a socialist. His talk was very true and good, and I have never forgotten. When I came to the United States, I hunted up the socialists. I became a member of a section. That was in the day of the SLP. Then later, when the split came, I joined the local of the SP. I was working in a livery stable in San Francisco then. That was before the earthquake. I have paid my dues for twenty-two years. I am yet a member, and I yet pay my dues, though it is very secret now. I will always pay my dues, and when the cooperative commonwealth comes, I will be glad. Left to myself, I proceeded to cook breakfast on the oil stove and to prepare my home. Often in the early morning, or in the evening after dark, Carlson would steal down to the refuge and work for a couple of hours. At first my home was the tarpaulin, later a small tent was put up, and still later, when we became assured of the perfect security of the place, a small house was erected. This house was completely hidden from any chance eye that might peer down from the edge of the hole. The lush vegetation of that sheltered spot make a natural shield. Also, the house was built against the perpendicular wall, and in the wall itself, shored by strong timbers, well-drained and ventilated, we excavated two small rooms. Oh, believe me, we had many comforts. When Biedenbach, the German terrorist, hid with us some time later, he installed a smoke-consuming device that enabled us to sit by crackling wood fires on winter nights. And here I must say a word for that gentle soul terrorist, than whom there is no comrade in the revolution more fearfully misunderstood. Comrade Biedenbach did not betray the cause, nor was he executed by the comrades as is commonly supposed. This canal was circulated by the creatures of the oligarchy. Comrade Biedenbach was absent-minded, forgetful. He was shot by one of our lookouts at the cave refuge at Carmel, through failure on his part to remember the secret signals. It was all a sad mistake and that he betrayed his fighting group is an absolute lie. No truer, more loyal man ever laboured for the cause. Note. Search as we may through all the material of those times that has come down to us, we can find no clue to the Biedenbach here referred to. No mention is made of him anywhere save in the Everhard manuscript. For nineteen years now, the refuge that I selected had been almost continuously occupied, and in all that time, with one exception, it has never been discovered by an outsider and yet it was only a quarter of a mile from Wixon's hunting lodge, and a short mile from the village of Glen Ellen. I was able, always, to hear the morning and evening trains arrive and depart, and I used to set my watch by the whistle at the brickyards. Note. If the curious traveller will turn south from Glen Ellen, he will find himself on a boulevard that is identical with the old country road seven centuries ago, 
A quarter of a mile from Glen Ellen, after the second bridge has passed, to the right will be noticed a barranca that runs like a scar across the rolling land toward a group of wooded knolls. The barranca is the site of the ancient right of way that in the time of private property and land ran across the holding of one Chauvet, a French pioneer of California, who came from his native country in the fabled days of gold. The wooded knolls are the same knolls referred to by Avis Everhard. The great earthquake of 2368 A.D. broke off the side of one of these knolls and toppled it into the hole where the Everhards made their refuge. Since the finding of the manuscript, excavations have been made, and the house, the two cave rooms, and all the accumulated rubbish of long occupancy have been brought to light. Many valuable relics have been found, among which, curious to relate, is the smoke-consuming device of Biedenbach's mentioned in the narrative. Students interested in such matters should read the brochure of Arnold Bentham, soon to be published. A mile northwest from the wooded knolls brings one to the site of Wake Robin Lodge, at the junction of Wild Water and Sonoma Creeks. It may be noticed in passing that Wild Water was originally called Graham Creek, and was so named on the early local maps. But the later name sticks. It was at Wake Robin Lodge that Avis Everhard later lived for short periods, when, disguised as an agent provocateur of the Iron Heel, she was enabled to play with impunity her part among men and events. The official permission to occupy Wake Robin Lodge is still on the records, signed by no less a man than Wixon, the minor oligarch of the manuscript. End of chapter 18 Recording by Matt Saw, Montreal, mattsaw.org